This Dragonlance setting takes place in Kryn, a war-torn world focusing on the continent of Ancelon. We have the Blue Fire Wardens who want their leader rescuing. We have the Death Knight Lord Soth, to a fashion. Teramini is the ritual bad girl. And the players appointed to the northern Dargard Mountains. Ish. In the vicinity. They can't get an exact pinpoint. It's more ambiguous than normal because it's been moved to a three moon vault, which has some sort of distortion magic on identifying where it, where it is exactly. As far as they know, the reading says the rod is near a massive tree. Not exactly that helpful. It's a magical moonlight which is warping the rod piece. So maybe get the characters to research in the library, in Sigil. The setting itself emphasises balance overall. That is the running theme of the world. There are lots of dragons and dragon kind. Many are loyal to the Dragon Queen Takesis, which is Dragonlance's Tiamat. Unusual dragons can be somewhat tricksy, up to their own schemes. All the land itself was battered by the Cataclysm, which made Kryn a bit like Game of Thrones, but with added monsters, thereby rendering it actually good. There's two main warlords seeking power. An elf mage, Thialthas, and Lord Soth, a Death Knight. And a good cuddle between the two just isn't going to fix things. Now, I actually had a video call with a friend, Alex Brailsford, who is more of an expert than I am on Kryn and has read the Dragonlance books for years of his life. And he looked upon the chapter with very much a, mm, actually, kind of point of view. Feels a bit rushed. Feels a bit like it's more incorrect fan fiction. So a few things I say in here are basically gathered from Alex's knowledge, not mine. In an attempt to be better than Star Wars, there's three suns rather than two. A white, a red and a black. When the players are ready to go, they come out near an enormous tree. There are two points of entry. One is kind of squirming under a boulder through a little hole. And the other is on a higher ledge. On the higher ledge is a camouflaged triant called Rosintar. They control two giant spiders. Triant is AC 16, 138 average health, vulnerable to fire obviously, resistant to bludgeoning and piercing, makes two slam attacks with plus 10 to hit, 16 average bludgeoning. Can throw rocks at you, plus 10 to hit for 28 bludgeoning average. And I would do away with the animate trees thing because it has the giant spiders. Giant spider is AC 14, 26 average health. The bite is plus 5 for 7 average piercing, but then it poisons you for 9 poison damage if you fail a DC 11 con save. Have a, they have web attacks, plus 5, which restrains the target. DC 12 strength check to get out. Rosenthal will quickly surrender, saying that inside is a nasty dryad called Gazaya. Oh, and a blue cloaked Kender. Now I'm going to offer you the Kender skirmisher stats, but it does say use Werewolf because these have been affected by lycanthropy. A Kender is AC 14 with average of 14 health. They are small. They have a weapon called a Hoopak. Plus 5 to hit, 6 piercing, or. 5 bludgeoning damage if they use the sling at the top to fire something. A taunt. Kendal launches a barrage of insults. DC 12 wisdom save or have disadvantage until the end of next turn. Here are the Kendal taunts in the Dragonlance book. And then a bonus action, disengage or hide. Werewolf stats then, what it wants you to use. I guess in human form AC 11 and 12 as a wolf. 58 average health. Melee attack plus 4. 6 piercing damage, and then the target has to succeed a DC 12 con save or be cursed with lycanthropy. Claws plus 4, 7 slashing damage. Now Alex had a bit of a problem with the whole werewolf thing. They're not technically canon as such. They have been in maybe one book. They're not like the norm. Just like a few other staples, like orcs I think he said, and something else, are not canon as such in this land. But hey, we'll all do what we want, right? So as they drop inside, it's a 50 foot drop, which is 5d6 fall damage, unless they come up with some feather fall, climb down carefully, whatever. They'll see a Kender rummaging down in the dirt, who will then become very defensive, but not really mean harm. Riffle is a member of the Blue Fire Wardens, 
and they oppose Lord Soth. He is looking for a pale on fruit to distract a monster who has blocked his mates in their own temple. So inside, the Gaziah, the dead back dryad, will approach everyone talking. I'll swap you a fruit for a magic item. Will be the offer. Gaziah was here to protect the rod piece, messed up, basically hid from the attack and it got stolen, and now has guilt. She's angry at herself, but lashes out to everyone around. She actually has a fruit on her. A dead back dryad has AC of 16, 107 average health, and resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, advantage on saving throws against spells, makes two poisonous thorn attacks and a sapping vine attack. Poisonous thorn, melee or range, plus 8, 14 piercing, 10 poison. The target must succeed on a DC 17 con save or have the poisoned condition until the start of the dryad's next turn. Sapping Vine is also plus 8. Grappled, escape DC 16. You're restrained. You take 13 necrotic damage every turn while you're grappled. The Dryad has 6 vines, so can grapple 6 characters. Maybe use the Spike Growth spell for a little bit of fun. If I hadn't already said in this series, I personally use full health, but quite often speed things up with just the average damage each time. So combat goes a little bit quicker as for rolling out damage, but since my players are generally max health possible, my monsters are max health possible. And that's not to drag combat out, that's to make sure we all get to use our good things. The monsters get to do whatever tricks are up their sleeve, and the players actually can each get a go doing whatever they choose. And if it drags on too long, I just say, hey, hey, killed it. At Bittergrass Fen, there's a Borthak trying to get into a cave entrance. The Wardens worship Habakkuk, divine power of persistence, lord of beasts and patron of the natural cycle of life and death. Using a ripe pale on fruit, you can distract the Borthak, allowing Riffle to enter the temple and rescue his friends. The Wardens will push the door open themselves, turn into werewolves and scarper. Now this hopefully comes as a shock to the players. They don't know that they're werewolves. They might kill the Borthak or they might not bother. I'm not especially excited by just another wolfy creature. So I'd maybe pick from the Dragonlance book an Istarian drone. Why not? Why does it want a pale on fruit? Mind your own business. As I say, Alex says that a lot of this doesn't really go into the Dragonlance lore, so... You can play around, especially if you have the Dragonlance book, as I do. I'm simply stealing other things inside of this. To boil down his points here, Lord Soth is more of a cool side character than a big boss of Dragonlance. He's the Darth Maul character. The three moons are colour-coded white for good magic, black for evil magic, and red for neutral magic. And where are the Draconians in this adventure? And the adult Lunar Dragon is apparently a weird choice for the big boss at the end. So Red Moon, Lunitare. White Moon, Solinare. Black, Nuitare. If I've got that wrong, sorry. So we have to look at the Borthak stats if you're running it straight. Borthak AC 16, 200 average health. One bite or one noxious regurgitation. And then two stomp attacks. Bite is plus 12. 16 piercing, plus 7 acid. Nice. 2 stomps is plus 12 also. 10 foot reach, 11 bludgeoning. The noxious, re- noxious? The noxious regurgitation spews acid 120 feet. The target makes a DC 21 con save, taking 24 acid damage and has the poisoned condition until the start of the Borthax next turn. Glacial Aura at the end of the Borthak's turn, Slippery Ice covers within 10 feet of the Borthak. Difficult terrain. DC 16, deck save or fall on your butt. A reaction, reactive tail. Creatures within 10 feet get hit with an attack roll. The Borthak swings its tail in retaliation. DC 16 or 16 bludgeoning damage. Legendary actions even. The Borthak can take three legendary actions. Moves, boring, bites, Cool. The Borthak makes a bike attack. I had written to swap out the Borthak for a Death Dragon. I've actually now swapped out the Lunar Dragon at the end for the Death Dragon. Both stats will be found at the end. 
which is why I ended up at the Astarian drone. So that is AC-17, 127 average health, immune to lightning and poison. Can't be frightened. Two claw attacks, plus eight, nine piercing, four lightning damage, and grappled. Crystalline spit. In a line, DC-15 deck save, 14 lightning damage, and you're restrained by the gel which hardens into crystal. Come on, that's cool, isn't it? The crystallization has 15 health, and... AC of 15, but it's vulnerable to thunder damage. Probably won't come up, will it? But you can ignore me just as you're ignoring the book. Or is that just me? The Kender race are supposed to be full of life, full of wonder, and they don't know fear. They literally do not know fear. They have no fear. So play with them as inquisitive with no regard for danger. It doesn't exist, which is why a lot of them end up dead. A lawful evil elf archmage called Terramini... Knight's Edge wears a red robe in the art, which Alex felt was kind of wrong. Alex felt it should be more of a black robe for you are the baddie. But, of course, it's within keeping with the Red Wizards of Thay, the generic 5e stance on baddie wizards. Terramini actually holds a grudge against the Wardens since she failed to join the ranks. Recently, after Terramini's soldiers stole the rod piece, she had something of a vision. She foresaw an attack coming, and she created a magical light that could transform werewolves into wolves, and she could better control them. All she would need to do is basically throw a stick. Now, the rod piece that she has itself has the regenerate spell attached to it, doesn't it? That is 48 plus 15 health. And it even can put sliced off body parts back on by merely holding them to the socket for a minute, which is damn cool in a fight scene. So the players hopefully meet up with the Kender werewolves, and one of the pack, Argentia Skyright, comes over and thanks the characters. There's an opportunity for role play and a bit of info dump, as Argentia says the players have to go to three moon vaults if they want the rod piece. While you're there, Please find Valandar. He's our leader. He may help you learn how to stop Terramini's ritual. Which she actually learned from a lunar dragon called Orinix. And there's a, there's a powerful wolf out barrier which keeps werewolves under control. Something that not even a good belly rub will snap the wolves out of. Argentia offers them a scroll of moonbeam, which causes a cylinder of radiant light, doing 2d10 radiant damage on a failed con save. Shape changes have disadvantage on the roll. Now, Valenda must be brought close to death to return to original form, a human. Argentia actually knows of a secret entrance, or a lesser known entrance. She casts a ward over Riffle, which stops the transformation of anybody within 10 feet of Riffle. For the next 12 hours. So why do we need the players to go in for them? Other than to get the rod piece back. I just find it weird that Riffle actually waits quite far around the corner and don't go in. So Three Moon Vaults is in the northern Dargard Mountains. An old goat path is where Riffle takes the party and says, I'll wait here. But didn't you just have a ward saying you would go in? Eh, area one. Two pillars either side of a double door with two moonlight guardians. Oh my god, they are cool. They fight. The moonlight guardian has an AC of 16, 105 average health. You cannot alter their form. They have advantage against the saves. If you use radiant damage on them, they actually heal. Two Moonlight Slams, plus seven, plus seven. Hits with eight plus four, eight plus four Radiant. Moonlight Blast, it unleashes a magical blast of moonlight in a 60 foot line. DC 14 Con Save. Creatures that are werewolves and the like have disadvantage on that save. They'll take 22 Radiant damage and are forced into their true form and can't change forms until the end of the Guardian's next turn. The door afterwards is trapped. It's a 30 foot cone which starts a DC-17 con save for 5d10 radiant damage. Area 2 is an elvish stone statue in a chamber. There's a plus one longsword, a shield, and a potion of vitality, which removes exhaustion 
Cures diseases and poisons. Plus, it means you heal the maximum amount on any healing rolls. Area 3 is a 100 foot long tunnel, not drawn out on the map for obvious reasons. It ends in a dead end, which has dimly glowing runes, and they have to trace on the runes to make the wall disappear. Area 4, there are four wraith soldiers on patrol in the area. One has a horn to a horn to alert other wraiths. A key can also be gained here. A wraith is AC 13, hit point 67, flies at 60 feet, resistant to the melee weapons unless they're silvered, can move through creatures and difficult terrain. Life drains you, plus 6, 21 necrotic damage. You succeed on a DC 14 con save or your hit point max is reduced by that damage. Have all four go for the strongest player. And then once that player is dead, create Spectre. The Wraith targets a humanoid within 10 feet who has been dead for no longer than a minute and died violently. The target's spirit rises as a spectre. We just killed a player, no comebacks is, we win. No, 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 that's not how it works, that's not how it works. We're all on the player's side. But you are dead, so. Five is a silvery sphere floating above a dais. It's actually floating liquid, which is used to communicate between Teramini and Lord Soth. The characters and anyone in this room can be heard and responded to by Lord Soth himself. A weaker Soth, Soth Jr, if you will, can come through this too. A totally silver Lord Soth, Death Knight, comes through. The sphere itself pops when the Death Knight pops. So Death Knight, challenge 17, what a shame, can't we use Lord Soth? And like, pull the punches if necessary. What is Lord Soth's challenge rating? 19. Come on. Okay, for you rules followers, here's the Death Knight. AC of 20, 180 health. It has advantage on magic. Any undead creatures of its choice, well, that's probably not going to come into it. The Death Knight is a 19th level spellcaster. Let's have a look backwards. Destructive Wave. What does that do? You strike the ground, creating a burst of energy. Each creature makes a con save or takes 5d6 thunder, as well as 5d6 radiant or necrotic up to you. That's cool. Gods, what's Staggering Smite? Staggering Smite. The next time you hit a creature with a melee weapon, your weapon pierces body and mind, takes an extra 4d6 psychic damage. Make a wisdom save or have a disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks and can't take reactions until the next turn. Interesting. Banishment. Elemental weapon. Hold person. This could be fun, but I'm hoping that Lord Soth is better. Death Knight makes three longsword attacks, plus 11 with its longsword, nine slashing, or ten slashing, plus 18 necrotic. It hurls a hellfire orb that explodes like a grenade. DC 18 deck save. 10d6 fire damage and 10d6 necrotic. It's a beauty. Parry reaction adds 6 to its AC. Lord Soth, my homie from another jabroni. Does that work? AC 18. No, it doesn't. Hit points, 228. Legendary resistance. I ain't having none of that three times a day. Of course, it has advantage against saves of magic. There probably won't be any more undead around. Soth makes four forsaken brand attacks. That's plus 12 four times. 10 slashing four times. 18 necrotic four times. And if the target is a creature, it can't regain hit points until the start of Soth's next turn. Now, of course, as a DM, you will roll terribly, like I do. Cataclysmic fire. Soth hurls a magical ball of fire. DC 19, 35 fire, 35 necrotic. Also, any medium or smaller human killed by, humanoid, killed by this damage becomes a skeleton under his control. He ain't messing about. Right, he can cast man banishment. Why can't he do all the same spells as the death knight? I say, come on, if the death knight, he is a death knight. You have my permission to use the spells we looked at for the death knight. Word of death. He points at a creature. He commands it to die. DC 19 con save, taking 100 necrotic damage. We killed two people this match. Look, do we need to talk about killing people in the game? You're the DM. You can bring them back. You can have them around using the ghost stats. If you remember, they're in this mission because the universe is pointing to them as the heroes. Therefore, something beyond their understanding can force them to stay alive, to seize the day and win the challenge. So if they're 
any in any way religious, they can have a vision of a god saying, "Now come on, try harder. You we need you're needed. Have them as a ghost until they go back to Sigil and have the magic people. You know, they cast reincarnate. There's just kill, kill, kill because you can put a nice plaster on it, kiss it better, and send them back on the next chapter. Fighting the big villains wants to feel like god damn that was brutal so don't pull any punches because vecna is going to be a son of a bitch in my game for sure legendary actions soth moves up to his speed commands a mount he's riding doesn't provoke opportunity attacks he can force people to make a dc 20 deck save on or, or knock them over did i say save deck save he can do another forsake, forsaken brand attack and he can also cast a spell Area 6, Empty Cells. Yippee! D&D loves empty cells for some reason. Improve this by adding loot, obviously, information in some way, callbacks to your previous games where nobody else in the world would know what you're talking about, but your players will love that. Foreshadowing of things to come, if you may. They hear pained dog howls coming from behind a door. Somebody has stepped on a dog's tail, maybe. Area 7, Valandar, is clutching at his body while being soaked in a red light which comes from a red moonlight firing off a ceiling mirror. The mad werewolf attacks. He actually looks like he's auditioning for the new hit musical, Dogs. Get Valandar back to normal and have him tell of the three vaults towers. They have special rooms called luminariums, which contain crystals infused with moonlight, essential to Teramini's ritual. Find three moonlight mirrors, then shine the mirrors onto other crystals. Valandar has one of those little nifty secrets. He didn't scout out the vault properly. He probably saw a squirrel or something. And underestimated Teramini's abilities, plans. Maybe he was just distracted by a vault of sticks down the road, and further down the road, a vault of straw, before finally making... You get the analogy. It's three little pigs. Area 8. Skeletons and zombies wander aimlessly. The cooler part is there's two ogre zombies. Now I like the idea that the ogre zombies just grab fistfuls of zombies and skeletons and hurl them at the players. For what it's worth, skeleton, AC 13, plus 4 short sword, 5 piercing. Likewise, zombie, AC 8, 22 health, slam plus 3, 4 bludgeoning. Ogre zombie. More interesting. AC 8, yes. Hit points 85. Has a little undead fortitude stat block with a con save and might only drop to 1 health. Morningstar plus 6, 13 bludgeoning. So all you do is you throw skeletons. The damage is plus 6 to hit and 13 damage. Just the same. Maybe it kills whatever it throws. Up to you. 9 is a spiral staircase. Yippee. 10. Locked door concealing a black rose bearer. Ooh, looks cool. AC 11. 110 health. Berserk. When the bearer takes damage, it makes a strength or deck save. Roll a d6. 5 or 6. It goes berserk. It has advantage on melee rolls. It can dash as a bonus action. It will target the nearest creature. It will hit anything, which is kind of a plus six attack. 12 bludgeoning, 11 necrotic. If damage reduces the Black Rose Bearer to zero, it's a con save. And again, does the Ogre Zombies only remains on one. Just have it come back once. You don't need to do that. Just when it dies, they think it's dead. Ta-da, comes back, surprise attack. A little thing I sometimes do as well for big bad guys is like when they're on 20 health, the next attack, as long as the attack doesn't down them, they go down as if dead. It hits the floor, it looks lifeless. And I'm waiting to see what happens. Because my villain is not dead. It's waiting to someone to try and loot it or something. And I never said it was dead. It goes for a final attack. And it's just pretty good, isn't it? Area 11, two Minotaur skeletons. There's also brown mould mentioned which is DC 13 con save, 8d8 necrotic damage, and the same HP reduction. Minotaur skeleton, AC 12, and hit points of 67. Vulnerable to bludgeoning. It can charge at you for 9 extra piercing damage. 
can knock you off your feet if you fail a DC 14 strength save. Great Axe plus 6, 17 slashing damage. The Gore Attack plus 6, 13 piercing damage. Well, that's the Minotaur Skeleton. What's your Minotaur Skeleton like? Area 12. Each vault is locked behind an iron door. A. Glyph of Warding, DC 17, 5d8 fire damage. There's money, gems, and art. Dull. Door B is a Behold a Zombie. Yes, Behold a Zombie. 18 AC, 93 hit point, it hovers. It also basically does that nifty thing where it can not die. Plus 3 melee for a bite, 14 piercing. But really, it's the Paralyzing Ray, Fear Ray, Innovation Ray, Disintegration Ray, all DC 14s, and try and get the particular classes with what you need to, you know, Fear for those who run in, brutalise it. So what, Barbarian, try and get those feared so they can't come closer. Paralyze wizards so they can't do soma- somatic spells. Disintegrate rogues because they're going to try and stun you. You know what I mean. C is empty. Fair enough. An empty room out of four. That's okay. D. Armor. Potion of greater healing. 44 plus 4. Scroll of stone skin. Resistant to bludgeoning and slashing and piercing from non magical effects. There's a blue cloak just like riffles. That's nice. Th- area 13. More brown mold. There's a rubble slope up to V14. 14, water and rubble. Area 15, a statue of Solinari, a god of good magic, illuminated by a white light shining from a mirror in its left arm. A guardian naga called Cassivus likes good people and those who wish to give evil a good thwarting. Guardian naga's AC 18, 127 health. If it dies, it returns to life later. 11th level spell casting. Let's see. Flame strike sounds good. Banishment. Hold person. That's about it. Bite plus 8. 8 piercing. Ouch. DC 15 con save, taking 45 poison damage. Spits at you. Disgusting for 18. It's DC 15 con save or 45 poison damage. What's its, what's its movement? 40 feet. Okay. The Naga will say to use the mirrors on the crystals. We know! But they don't know which order, though, do they? An orrery in the red tower will show you the current moon phase and light to crystal combination. Plus the passphrase of that door over there is buried is best. There's a locked stairwell is 16. The, the password we just told you. Area 17, a crumbling tower ruin with a ladder up. 18, rubble which can be traversed across an area with camps and seven veterans, maybe? You can swap the veterans for something else. Such as a Kapak Draconian from Dragonlance. Kapak Draconian, AC 15, hit points 39. Stealthy boy. When the Draconian is reduced to zero, it dissolves into acid and splashes. DC 12, deck save, or you're covered in acid for a minute. It's seven acid damage at the start of every turn. A action has to be used to scrape it off or it'll just keep acid in you. Glide. When it falls, it flies, basically. It makes two dagger attacks. DC 12 con save or you're poisoned. Plus five to hit. Five piercing, seven poison. While poisoned in this way, the target is also paralysed. Nice. If you don't like that, and yet you still don't want to use the veteran stats, I offer you something else. A dragon army officer, maybe. AC 19, 65 health. The officer has advantage on attack rolls. Makes two vicious lance attacks and uses its assault orders. Vicious lance is plus five, eight piercing, two fire damage. as a crossbow. The officer shouts orders and targets up to two other creatures. Basically, whoever those seven people you just had them go by, they can use their reactions to make one attack. Area 19 is a white tower lookout. Now this can have the veteran on. That's all right. It's carrying a goat horn to raise alarm. If you really insist, a veteran is 17 AC, 58 health, two long sword attacks, plus five, seven to hit, an average seven slashing damage, eight slashing of two-handed, and small weapons. Area 20, a spiral staircase leads to a ruined chamber with ornate pillars 
that have drawings of celestial bodies on. A staircase further up will take you to the white luminarium. Right, 21, a drawbridge. There are two levers. They have to be pulled together. It takes a minute for the thing to activate. Area 22, a ladder from the courtyard reaches two veterans. You decide. They have horns to raise the alarms. 23, a wall walkway which passes through the second floor of each moon tower. 24, two enormous bone rocks who are trained as mounts. So it's unlikely you'll get into a pickle with them. But since we're such good friends, you and I, AC 15 for the bone rock, 133 health. Flies 90 feet. It's vulnerable to bludgeoning because it's bones. It makes one beak attack, which is plus 8, 14 piercing. And two talons, plus 8, 12 slashing and 10 necrotic. Yeah, sure. 25, an open air plaza with moon rock tiles. 26, simple beds and baths. 27, weapon racks, whatever weapons you like, plus oil of sharpness. It lasts an hour and puts plus three to your attacks and damage. That's good, isn't it? Area 28 is an iron throne and an iron statue. A mirror is fastened to the headrest of the throne, pointing out to the courtyard. It's the black moonlight mirror. 29, an orrery. It's in motion from a red light beam from Area 30. It spins to represent the three moons of Kryn. A character check will learn that you need the red to shine on the white crystal, the white onto the black and the black onto the red. Area 30 is a shiny red mirror. 31. A room for Teramini. Four poster bed, writing desk, bookshelves, foot locker. The foot locker is a mimic. Mimic AC 12, 58 average health. Immune to acid. Right, so it plus fives with its tongue or whatever. Seven bludgeoning. And then you are subjected to the adhesive piece. It's basically grappled you for DC 13 escape. And you have disadvantage on getting off of the tongue. It bites you for plus five. Seven piercing and four acid. I personally generally forget that the tongue stays stuck and it's a kind of a grapple. Do you do that? No, because you're better than me. There's a log book. On one page, it describes the locations of two white mirrors, V15 and V20, two red mirrors, V7 and V30, two black mirrors, V28, V36. Another page talks of the rod piece and three lunar crystals. Also, there's a stairway to the Red Tower Luminarium. 32, a stairway to V9. 33, a muddy yard with two earth elementals hidden in mud. Earth... Elemental, AC 17, 126. Health, they can burrow. They're vulnerable to thunder. Two attacks, plus eight, 14 bludgeoning. Pretty basic. Area 34 is a circular wall with curtained alcoves. Further in, ill emanating chanting. Chalk runes are lit by black candles, which also illuminate a necromantic wizard called Akaki. Is that right, Akaki? Akazi. And a black rose bearer. High above hangs a black moonlight mirror from Jane's. So we've done the black rose bearer. And then it's the romantic wizard. Oh, sorry, the necromantic wizard. AC 15 with mage armor. He's not stupid. 110 health. Three arcane bursts. Plus seven to hit. 25 necrotic damage. Circle of death. Dimension door. Web. Yeah. Summons undead. Five skeletons or zombies. That's all right. Grim Harvest, it heals for nine health off dead people. 35 is a stone altar. There's a staircase down to V10, a secret door, and a wand of enemy detection, which I don't need to tell you what that does. But it has seven charges. You speak a command word. For the next minute, you know where the nearest creature hostile to you is, but not its distance. 36, three iron chains hold that black moonlight mirror. 37, 20 ravens in cages and a stairway up to U3. Okay, we get to that beautiful top level layer, which is three towers, and in the middle, some magical moonlight creating a platform. The coloured glass over each dome, it filters the light so that only one of the moon's light is let in. They are filters. There are deuses with moonlight barriers protecting the lunar crystals from anything. They cause a DC 15 conserve. It gives you poison damage. Nothing can pass through them. Nothing can physically pass through solid moonlight or teleport through it. It's immune to all damage. Can't be dispelled by dispel magic. The ritual is powered by the rod piece and is therefore unaffected by the anti-magic field. 
And so how they get through that is mentioned very soon. U1 is a white luminarium DC-17 concept or you're blinded by the lovely white light. U2 is the red luminarium. There's a death wolf created by the body of a dead blue fire warden. So if we're doing weird stuff, why not replace them with Grim Hollow's Gluttony Seraph or a Gore Elemental? The Death Wolf, AC 15, 153 health, speed 40. It can legendary resists failed saves twice. Takes no fall damage as such. Makes a bite attack. Plus 10, 14 piercing, plus 9 necrotic. DC wisdom save or you have disadvantage on saving throws against a frightened condition. Two claw attacks, plus 10, 12 slashing damage, plus four necrotic. The werewolf creates a terrifying phantom of itself in the mind of its target. It's DC 17 intelligence save, or you are frightened. While the target is frightened, 21 psychic damage at the start of every turn. Its reactions, when a creature within five feet makes an attack roll against it, it's a DC 17 wisdom so save, or you have disadvantage on that attack. After the attack hits or misses, the death wolf makes a claw attack against the creature. Phase step. Immediately after taking damage, the death, wo- the death wolf... Jesus. The death wolf teleports up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space it can see. Well, that'll do. The gluttony seraph is AC 15. Hit points 218 on average. Telepathy. Spells, not really applicable here. Advantage on saving throws against spells. When the Seraph hits with any weapon, the weapon deals extra 2-8, 2d8 radiant. It makes three attacks, a bite plus 10, 24 piercing damage plus 9 radiant. Can be grappled, DC 18 escape. Claws plus 10, 12 slashing, 9 radiant. Tongue plus 10, 10 bludgeoning, 9 radiant. Grappled, restrained. Swallow, whatever it's grappling takes 18 acid damage, 9 radiant, and if the Seraph takes 35 damage, to DC 20 con save, or you're thrown back up. The Gore Elemental AC 16, 110 health. Vulnerable to Psychic, Gruesome Deluge, plus 7, 8 bludgeoning damage, 4 necrotic, DC 15 save, or you're grappled. Grizzly Mire, each creature grappled makes a DC 15 strength save, or you take... 15 slashing, plus 5 necrotic, and you're now prone. Blind, restrained, unable to breathe, and can be moved. Reaction, swirling crimson. If the gore elemental reduces anyone to zero, the size increases to huge. It gains advantage on all strength and conserves. It now can grapple large creatures, or I guess you could say two of the party at the same time. Deals 10 slashing, plus 7 necrotic, and then it'll return to normal size if it has less than 55 health. To be fair, all those three are pretty spicy. Quite nice. Area three is the Black Luminarium. Now, two Black Rose Bearers. What, again? If you like them, not a problem. But if you don't, is the Ankle Ox. He's a huge undead. AC 15, 157 health. Makes two claw attacks, plus 10. Hit 17, piercing. Pushes you. DC 18, strength save, or you're pushed. 20 feet, possibly possibly off the tower to a 100 foot drop. Entrapping rend, plus 10, 23 piercing. Or DC 18 saving th- strength saving throw, or you're trapped in the rib cage and grappled. You're restrained. That's nice, isn't it? Area 4, bridges of literal moonlight. To the centre disc, you, area 5, a disc platform of moonlight. Upon which Teramini stands with the rod piece hovering between her hands. She's just begging to be yeeted off. Baldur's Gate 3 bad guy style. But don't allow that. So how do you disrupt the ritual? Well, they either point the magical mirrors of moonlight at opposing crystals, the correct ones that they've learnt. Or two, they just smash and steal the actual crystals, the lunar crystals. Or you, being such a clever DM that you are, you've come up with something of your own and it's pretty cool and well done. Culminating in a portal opening where Orinix, the adult lunar dragon, comes through or my death dragon. Either way, that dragon will attack Teramini first, which is interesting. Now, Alex, my expert, wasn't really that keen on the lunar dragon, 
but that's why I pulled this My Dragon out of the Dragonlance book. Same sort of challenge rating, pretty much. Here are both stats. Adult Lunar Dragon is AC 17, 172 health, fly speed of 80 feet, two, only two legendary resistances, can burrow through solid rock, makes a bite attack, plus 11, reach of 10 feet, it's a 13 piercing and three cold damage. Then two claw attacks, plus 11, 13 slashing damage. The tail is plus 11, 13 bludgeoning damage. It's cold breath, it's a blast of frost, DC 18 con save or 36 cold damage, and your speed is zero. Bonus action, three times a day, phase. The dragon is partially ghostly and has resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. It works like a concentration spell, it's that, you know. The save to break concentration is either 10 or half the damage taken to knock it out of its concentration. Legendary actions. The dragon can make two legendary actions. Tail attack, sure. Treacherous ice is a difficult terrain thing. Oh my greater death dragon. AC 16, 230 health. Three legendary resistances. Makes a bite attack, plus 11. 17 piercing, plus four necrotic and grappled. DC 19. Claws, plus 11. So two of these attacks. 10 slashing damage. Cataclysmic Breath, Purple Ghostly Flames in a 60 foot cone, DC 18 Dex Save or 45 Necrotic Damage, a creature dies if the breath reduces it to zero, well yeah, but it become, your player comes back as a zombie under the dragon's control. Legendary Actions, a Claw Attack, a Cataclysmic Rush, rushes at you, passes through you and you take 4 Necrotic. 4 Necrotic, is that all? So they get the Rod Piece, they high five, and we start to prep the next chapter.